नमस्कार हार्टी वेलकम टू दी फिफ्टीन सेशन ऑफ द थ्री डे ऑनलाइन कॉन्फ्रेंस ऑन एनवायरमेंट एंड लिटरेचर बीइंग कंडक्टिंग बाय साहच अकेडमी एंड इन कोलैबोरेशन विद फाउंडेशन ऑफ सार्क राइटर्स एंड लिटरेचर दैट इज मोस्ट वॉर and uh, this session is dedicated for paper presentation uh, and uh, in this session we have uh, uh, four in fact five presentations um, and uh, 10 minutes has been allotted to each uh, participant and this session is going to be chaired by uh, ms uh, uh, kanchana uh, priyakanta ji from uh, sri lanka and we have uh, uh, five paper presentation by yam shahinur rahman from bangladesh uh, rupa singh bhandari from nepal mohammad uh, hasan jan from bangladesh poonam nigam sahai ji from india and uh, uh, kanchana priya uh, priyakanta ji from uh, sri lanka now may I request uh, uh, mr kanchana uh, priyakanta ji to kindly take over the session okay thank you Uh, i warmly welcome uh, the delegates present here today to the uh, 15th session of uh, the online literature conference on environment and literature uh, organized by foundation of sark writers and literature in collaboration with sahitya academy so uh, now i would like to invite uh, mr shahinur rahman from bangladesh to present his paper is he present is it there mr shahinur rahman from no, no 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 uh, rahman ji is at to join we have we now miss uh, dr poonam nigam sahai ji <coughs> from india and yourself for the time being i think uh, yeah great uh, so i'd like to uh, uh, yeah for the time being i think you may request uh, uh, dr poonam nigam sahai ji to present her uh, uh, paper i think okay sure uh so dr poonam nigam uh, it's your time to uh, do the presentation thank you i hope i am audible i hope i am audible yes ma'am it's audible it's clear it's clear oh. yes uh so friends uh, uh thank you it's a very warm sunny day today over here at rachi and uh, i am really uh, grateful to coswal to uh, madam ajit kaur to dr n suresh babu sir and kanchana priyakanta ji for uh, being here to witness my presentation and uh, i am an associate professor of english uh, at rachi university i work at the university department of english ranchi university and uh, i teach language literature and linguistics so uh, but but my love for literature is not at all lessened by being in linguistics or language because i think i am always motivated more and more towards literature and uh, i congratulate the organizers for uh, this excellent topic uh, the broad theme of environmentalism and peace in literature and and ancillary areas also so i begin with that i am broadly uh, concentrating on representative uh, representation of nature in ancient indian literature so these are some of my reflections in the contemporary literary parlance the term eco criticism has gained wide currency in view of the growing global concern for the degradation of ecological landscape climate and the environmental bodies what 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 do we really mean by this term eco criticism it's one of the ways in which the literary study builds up the close architectural bond between the human world and the close architectural bond between the human world and the ecological world 
the literary manifestation of the physical world indeed grows out of the nightmarish awareness that the physical environment, which is indispensable for sustaining human life on earth, is almost on the verge of extinction owing to the indiscriminate use of science and technology. This grave environmental crisis is no doubt posing a threat to human existence and the need for creating a sustainable as well as a balanced relationship between man and the natural world, and which is one of the most urgent social environmental issues at hand. The noted historian Donald Woster says, we are facing a global crisis today, not because of how ecosystems function, but rather because of how our ethical systems function. Getting through the crisis requires understanding our impact on nature as precisely as possible. But even more, it requires understanding those ethical systems and using that understanding to reform them. Historians, along with literary scholars, anthropologists, and philosophers, do the reforming, of course, but they can help with the understanding by creating a mindset that is. Now, my paper concentrates on the basic premise that in Indian worldview, the awareness of the harmonious bond of the human nature with the physical environment was already acknowledged. And a survey of classical literature speaks not merely of the poet's profound preoccupation with, but touching sensibility to the entire gamut of biosphere bodies. In Indian philosophical thought, the organic relation of humans to the biological nature has always been emphasized. That nature is an inseparable part of human and cultural discourse has been very well articulated in the Vedas. Everything that exists is an emanation, emanation from and is in a sense Brahman that is absolute leading to the leading to the Indian philosophers, to the use of language of man is nature or man in nature and not man against nature at all. The Indians also avoid all issues of domination and subordination in ecological ethics. Quoted by Rama Papu, page 299. This unified view of man and nature is the fundamental truth and essence of what we call Indian. The modern Western worldview of what Mishra calls the Greco-Roman worldview marks a clear break from the classical Indian point of view in the sense that the former looks upon nature as the other, making it subordinate to the dominant force of man. The Vedic and the Upanishadic perspectives, on the other hand, have a different philosophy and the survey of literature corroborates the fact that human treatment of and interface with the environment was dictated by the religious and the ethical set of values. This also constitutes a part of our Hindu cultural ethos, thereby underlining the Indian worldview strongly. This is with reference to particularly the Vedic lit literature composed between 1600 and 600 BC, which is the oldest recorded literature in India, celebrating the multifarious aspects of natural ecological world in religious spirit. In Vedic literature, earth has been deified and endowed with all the mother qualities. It is in the other way that we find for the first time the elaborate description of lavishing appreciation on nature and environmental bodies. One does not lose sight of the unspeakable stamp of celebration in the scriptural text as the hymns invoke the Mother Earth. O Mother Earth, sacred are thy hills, snowy mountains and deep forests. Be kind to us and bestow upon us happiness. 
May you be fertile, arable, and nourisher of all. May you continue supporting people of all races and nations. May you protect us from your anger, that is natural disasters, and may no one exploit and subjugate your children. This is from Athar Way, section 12. What we observe here is that the spiritual kinship existing between man and his surrounding nature, one of the significant pronouncements recorded in the Vedic texts, and this has universal appeal and note as well, irrespective of nationality, gender, or class. In Indian thought, the hierarchy between the human world, the environment world is markedly absent. Rather, the attitude towards nature is one of extreme reverence and worship. In sharp contrast to that, the present environmental hazards and the crisis aggravated by the utter indifference to and the merciless exploitation of nature by human beings put our existence at stake. In this context, the words as inscribed in Vedic texts are critique of modern human beings, insensible way of looking uh, at nature from the colonizer's perspective by subjugating nature to our will. In them we hear the voice of the Vedic seers running across the whole of the universe, thereby emphasizing the vital and organic relation amongst all creatures. Vedic man's closeness to nature reminds us of the Greek Gordian knot, which in the words of Vanity, there is an interesting parallel of the Greek Gordian knot, where Indra and Agni are in both. May you cut the evils like tangles of the creeping plant. The string to be cut is made of natural wines. The Vedic man shows his intimacy with nature as he sees health as the law and disease as the breakdown of order or law, which in this case is the breakdown of the equilibrium among internal factors of the body, of the mind, of the physiology, as well as the breakdown of the balance between body and mind on one side and environment on the other. Man always used to stay in a harmonious and non-reciprocal touch with nature. So much so, the tree worship was greatly involved in ancient times. Concerning flora in the Hindu religion, as early as in the times of the Rig Veda, tree worship was quite popular and universal. The tree symbolized the various attributes of God to the Rig Vedic seers. They were considered as animate beings, feeling happiness and sorrow. Green trees are likened to a living person also. The Rig Veda, which primarily dwells on the account of the immigration of the Aryans in the initial stage of the period, does not contain as much description of man nature relationship as that of the other ways. In the Yajur way, we have beautiful description of nature. In spring, the winds blow coolly like water. The rivers and ocean flow calmly and medicinal herbs are filled with sweet juice. In spring, let trees give us sweet fruits, the sun physical strength and the cows sweet milk. This is from the Yajurveda chapter 13. So this is the question of pollution that has been plaguing the whole world for a long time was recorded in the ancient texts too, like Kautilya's Arthashas and Charaka Samhita. At that time, people had to abide by proper code of conduct in the society, which I would say people have forgotten now. And so they, uh, made a, a healthy and balanced order was maintained in the society. In Kautilya, it is observed, the punishment of one eighth of a pana should be awarded to those who throw dirt on the roads. For muddy water, one fourth pana. If both are thrown, the punishment should be doubled. If lacrim is thrown or caused near a temple, well, or pond, or sacred place, or maybe a government building, then the punishment should increase gradually by one pana in each case. For urine, the punishment would be half. 
The word vikriti, which is connotative of the modern system of pollution, was very well known to them. Charaka dwelt a great deal on the health hazards caused by pollution. The pollution is mixed with unhealthy elements. The air is uncharacteristic of the season, full of moisture, stormy, hard to breathe, icy cool, hot and dry, harmful, roaring, coming at the same time from all directions. The unity of all creatures on earth is recorded in the Upanishad and is also voiced in Kalidas. Nature is not merely a botanical construct, but much more than that. It is very much living and is symbolized as the female half of his, that is Siva's cosmic unity. So I would like to wind up. This is my paper in short. And uh, I think I think I'm very grateful uh, to Madam Ajit Kaur and all the organizers for uh, pointing out this particular topic on which we can dwell and uh, make the conference a great successful conference. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Poonam. So now I think uh, Mr. Shahirur is here, right? Yeah, yeah, we have, we have with us. Uh, so I'd like to invite Mr. Shahirur to uh, present his paper. Shahinur Rahmanji from Bangladesh. Yeah, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I, I can hear you. Well, thank you very much to be here with you. I'm a bit late because, you know, because of my being in a meeting. However, uh, you know that today's topic is uh, an environment, focal in, in environment. And you know that People around the world uh, do not have a clear idea about folklore. Most of the people who know, who know the term folklore also know that folklore is related to pigeons, the illiterate in the literate society, and the only forms of folklore restricted to those that were orally transmitted. These beliefs have so strongly gripped the general notion about folklore to overflow. Actually, you know, folklore is not that simple or that small. It is very wide. How? Thompson has divided the term into two words, folk and law. Then who are the folks? For example, we are four, you know, are participating in this seminar today. We four are folks. I am from Bangladesh and you three from other parts of the world. So everyone is a folk. And what is load? Load is related to the folks society, tradition, culture, history, family, politics, economy, blah, 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 blah. So I mean that a folk means an individual. So an individual is related to the past events and the events occurring around him or her. So in this way, a folk is not actually someone who belongs to the village or who only believes in ghosts or something like this. Even a modern man in the world is a folk. And that folk has got to know about what is going on around him and around, around his, his, his or her society or around the world. And thus he or she gathers knowledge. Then he or she or this person is a folk. That's why we should not undermine the word folklore because folklore is not that 
you know, that, you know, it should not be insulted or humiliated. It is now a discipline worldwide. And I'm a student of Henry Glassy. Henry Glassy taught me folklore. And according to Henry Glassy, definition of folklore are as numberless as insects. But all the definitions bring into dynamic association the ideas of individual creativity and collective order. Folklore is traditional. Its center holds. Changes are slow and steady. Folklore is variable. The tradition remains wholly within the control of its practitioners. It is theirs to remember, change or forget. Answering the needs of the collective for continuity and of the individual for active participation. Folklore is that which is at once individual, traditional, and variable. However, William A. Wilson says, surely no discipline is more concerned with linking us to the cultural heritage from the past than is folklore. No other discipline is more concerned with revealing the interrelationships of different cultural expressions than is folklore. And no other discipline is so concerned with discovering what it is to be human. It is this concept to discover the basis of our common humanity, the imperatives of our human existence that puts folklore study at the very center of humanistic study. So from this definition, we understand that folklore actually, uh, you know, shows us the way to be human and teaches us humanity because folklore gives, gives us the scope to understand every single event of human life and thus, Usually folklorists or the persons who study folklore become very much sympathized with the people living around him or her. However, today my topic is folklore is folklore that is environment, folklore in environment. So now I'm going to talk about Environment, environment in folklore, as always, you know, folklore or environment plays the most important role at every sphere of our life, which constitute folklore. Why? Environment means, for example, our culture, our tradition, our language, our behavioral pattern, our community, all these constitute our environment. Let me give an example. Think, let us think about the partition back in 1947. So colonial rule, you know, departed, but we people had been divided. So that was the environment. And that environment, you know, made us do things in such a manner in ways that is that environment created or invented different folklores. So we know that there is few individuals who created environments that helped folklore get the speed to occupy different positions in all sections of the global context. Then who are the creative individuals using environment in folklore? Who are those people? The answer lies in a few individuals who made environments, whose people from different corners have, have been following generations after generations since the creations of the practices. Practices means environment or, or traditions. We all are born in a particular community within set rules, customs, and traditions. And I mean that we should understand how an individual creates environments of habits living in the same neighborhood based on the 
culture of the individual's community. The individual gives us something new which is different from the usual practice. Let me give an example. So let me talk about the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibu Rahman, in the context of Bangladesh. You know that he, he, he gave us a, an independent country like Bangladesh. So he created the environment. During his time, he had to struggle a lot, but he created such an environment in which he established the Bengali culture in the context of Bangladesh. So that environment, environment made him make a series of struggles and series of incidents that constituted the liberation war in 1971. And finally, you see that the historic speech of 7th March in 7th March in 1971, you know, opened the door for all the Bengalis to fight against the uh, Pakistani armies and thus uh, for long uh, nine months, uh, war and struggles and bloodshed, uh, we had to achieve this independence. So in this manner, you see that Bangamundhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman is uh, an exceptional individual who created a kind of environment by which he made an independent country like Bangladesh. And here, let me talk about one thing. You know, the recent, uh, recent uh, theorists and uh, academics Ray Cashman, Tom Mould, Pravina Shukla, Pravina Shukla is the wife of Henry Glassy, give an opinion in the following lines. I'm quoting, we all, we are all of us, whatever storytellers, teachers, singers, scholars, poets, curators, painters, parents, individuals, working within, within tradition or environment that we shape and reshape. All of us, all of us use elements of the past to meet our needs in the present and our hopes for the future. In process, we make tradition our own, leaving our marks. These marks may be deemed art, craft, communication, performance, folklore, but all of them are simultaneously life history, a reflection of self as forced in the shaping and reshaping of tradition. The relationship between individual, individual and tradition is something that is very, very important for all of us. So in this way, you have many examples like this. And let me just uh, get, uh, take an example from Shakespeare. Shakespeare is also an exceptional individual. For example, in Hamlet, he uses ghost. Then what does he mean by the use of ghost? You know that Hamlet was very popular and even today he is a very, very modern, modern dramatist and we people emphasize Shakespeare at most because he is really an exceptional one from whom we learn a lot. So he created the character Hamlet and then he created the character, the ghost of Hamlet, that is ghost of Hamlet, that is senior Hamlet, that is the father of Hamlet. And here he, uh, let me quote one line. Hamlet is speaking to his, to the ghost of his father. Hamlet, speak, I'm bound to hear, ghost. So art thou to repent when thou shalt hear. So when you will hear my words, you will, B, you will be ready to take the revenge. Hamlet, what ghost? I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night and for the day confined to fast in fire. So here you see all these stories, we, whether, we do, whether we believe in ghost or not does not matter. 
what matters is that we have such belief existing in our society. So such belief has been created, such environment has been created by Shakespeare in his famous drama or play, Hamlet. In the similar manner, in Macbeth, Shakespeare has also used the wishes. Wishes we see, we see that is the woman ghost. So Macbeth says, speak, if you can, what you are. First wish, all hail Macbeth, hail to the thin of glims. That is, the, 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 the wishes, wishes forecasting the future of Macbeth. So in this manner, Shakespeare has created environments in his plays in such a way in which we people seem to believe in what is happening. And it is, it is also creating suspense. In real life, ghost, you know, we know that we know that there, there, there should not be any existence of ghost. But what is true is that we believe in ghost. That is, the belief of ghost exists all over the world. Even in USA, I found so many people who believe in ghost and they become afraid at night. That is true. However, in King Lear, we have the story of, story of uh, salt-like love. That is salt like love, you know, that is the story of three daughters, the taste of love, the father wants to know about how much love that is the, the story is completely the source of writing King Lear. So Gondriel and then Regan, two elder sisters, you see that is praise their father in such a manner that their father become very convinced and they give their, they give his wealth to the elder daughters, but he disowns the youngest one because she tells the truth that she loves as much as her father deserves. However, in this manner, you see the environment has the most important uh, impact on folklore. And without environment, we cannot actually write, write things or matters. And even here, uh, I'm, I, I, I was hearing the, I was listening to the, uh, the, 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 the speech of, of, my, of, of, of another speaker. And she was speaking in a very good manner. And she is surely in, influenced by the environment uh, from where she has collected all these uh, all these materials for speaking, and Fokil Lalunsha, Fokil Lalunsha, that is one mystic bowl uh, from Bangladesh. Fokil Lalunsha, I hope that you know about him. He was a person uh, who was secular, and uh, at the same time, uh, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was also very secular. He dreamed of making a Bangladesh where uh, people from all religion must enjoy the same, you know, same right, that is similar right, no differences. So Fakir Lalunsha, that is Bengali mystic poet Fakir Lalunsha, in his songs or in his poetry, has also told us about how all people should be one platform and there should not be any difference between religions, between individuals, between classes. He didn't allow any discrimination. So what was the environment? The environment was completely against him, but he himself made such an environment in which he tried to make the society which should be good or which should be helpful and which should be beneficial to
to the human society to the people in general all over the world so here you see that his song like the man of my heart dwells inside me everywhere i look it is he in my every every sight in this sparkle of light oh i can never lose him here there everywhere where i turn he is right there that is it is something that has to do with the mysticism or spirituality or spiritualism so in this manner okay lalun shah has tried to uh make his own environment for writing his poetry and we know that a uh, mystic baul poet bengali poet fakir lalun shah uh, was born in sase sase an environment which was not favorable for him and and you know that uh, one of the greatest mystic singers in indian subcontinent has ever produced lalun was perhaps the most radical voice in india during british colonial rule fakir lalun shah who has created tradition or environment that has been continuing through constructions institutionalizations change and innovations since the beginning of the 18th century and hobson hobson one of the theorist who has defined who has defined that invented tradition as a set of practices normally governed by the world overtly or or tacitly accepted rules and of a ritual of symbolic nature who is seek to inculcate certain values and norms of behavior by repetition which automatically implies continuity with the past however my purpose is to show in this context the dynamics of lalun's environment by which he has made the creativity in his society and i want to say something about the similarities and this dissimilarities at different stages between the past and the present yes you see that things do not remain same environment changes for example now you see the world context the world context is quite different than even you know just you let us look at two months before so two months before two months and the present so these two two concepts or do these two environments are quite different so over time things change and environment also over time changes and in this way transmission transmission happens and this process of transmission to what extent relates to jennifer robertson who is another uh, theorist uh the theorist the theorist concept is that the history is both a uh spontaneous process and a social production constituting ways in which the past is continuously organized represented reclaimed reworked and reproduced as memory which may be private or public and popular so in this manner we are always being introduced to environments in different contexts in different manners however today actually i am not going to prolong my space but i am very happy to join this seminar and i will send the paper written paper to this forum uh, so that you can go through all the contents and now you you can say that i just made my speech almost i made the extempore speech uh, uh hopefully i will i uh, try to make it better than today thank you thank you thank you very much uh, thank you mr uh, shailu so i'd like to invite mr uh, mohammed hasan jang to uh, present your paper uh thank you so am i audible yes. my voice is clear yeah it's clear yes okay thank you so uh, it's uh, a privilege for me that i've been able to join such an erudite and scholarly gathering and it's not an easy task for me to present papers after uh two papers that were kind of heavy weight 
and so full of references, but still I'll try to uh, give it a try. So <clears throat> the title of my paper that I'll be presenting is uh, Hearing the Marginalized Voices from Bangladesh and Eco-Critical Reading of the Poetry of Garo and Chakma Communities. Um, I have collected the poems from a book that's called Anthology of Indigenous Poetry of Bangladesh, uh, compiled and edited by uh, Professor Himel Borkut. The book uh, samples approximately 300 poems from 23 uh, different uh, ethnic uh, and indigenous tribes. And that makes this book the largest volume of its kind. And uh, to tell you uh, one more information, Garu and Chakma are also two of the largest indigenous tribes of Bangladesh. So let me now jump into my paper. <clears throat> in a recently published article in The Guardian, the indigenous communities have been mentioned as caretakers of the environment and critical guardians of biodiversity. The article states, quote, though indigenous peoples comprise only around 6% of the global population, they protect 80% of biodiversity left in the world, unquote. For centuries, the indigenous peoples have directly depended on nature for their livelihood without causing any major harm to the ecological balance mainly because they possess a strong ecological empathy towards and a spiritual bond with mother nature. However, it is also their dependence upon as well as their proximity to nature that has ironically put them on the front line of any possible cataclysmic impacts of the current global environmental crisis, which can potentially displace them from their homelands and turn them into climate change refugees. In a recently held webinar that was titled Monster, a Fugue in Fire and Ice, uh, arranged by Princeton University, contemporary writer Annie McClintock talked about the idea of displacement, which is very interesting, and I want to shed some light on that. She said, uh, I mean, discussed or described displacement as both removal from place as well as removal of place. So that's very interesting, removal from place as well as removal of place. What does she mean by that? She asserts, quote, what I mean by displacement is not merely the violent removal of people or other species from a place. I also mean displacement as quite literally the removal of place, uh, soil erosion, for example, unquote. Based on McClintock's observation, it could be profoundly suggested that displacement of the indigenous people and the damage of landscapes are simultaneous and so quite inextricably linked with each other. However, in an age when the earth has entered the Anthropocene and human-induced climate change and concomitant environmental disasters are threatening the very existence of humans and other species on earth, we still continue to think about the ongoing ecological disasters as natural, and inevitable, which definitely shows our indifference and lack of empathy that mainly result from our hubristic attitude and anthropocentric worldview. Eco-critics and nature writers strongly lambast this kind of mindset. Um, and I was actually going to give reference to Donald Worcester, but my fellow presenter has already mentioned that. And I was going to make exactly the same quote about why we are facing a global crisis today because of our ethical problems. I'll, I'll skip that because it has already been mentioned by my honorable co-presenter, Dr. Uh, Sahai. Okay, so moving on. Amidst this crisis, when we needed some guiding principles and environmental philosophy, deep ecology and ecosophy movements were born. According to Fridge of Capra, deep ecology recognizes the intrinsic values of all living beings and does not separate humans from the natural environment. Um, another great theorist, Felix Guattari, describes ecosophy as a complex ethical political articulation between the three ecological registers, namely the environment, social relations, and human subjectivity. However, the question that still probably remains is, to what extent has deep ecology or ecosophy been able to surpass the contours of the academic and the intellectual world and be widely accepted and collectively practiced by people? Another major obstacle in fighting the climate crisis, as uh, uh, Rob Nixon brilliantly points out in his book, Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor, is the relative invisibility of slow, slow violence 
Um, by slow violence, he means a violence that does not necessarily take place in a specific time and space. One of the most pertinent questions that Rob Nixon asks is, how can we convert into image and narrative the disasters that are slow moving and long in the making? Because like when we say violence, we imagine something bloody, something happens that happens in an instant time and space. But environmental disaster is something that's apparently invisible. So Rob Nixon's question is, how can we create images that can help us perceive the damages that are being done to our landscapes? So how could we like um, poetically or visually uh, understand and describe slow violence? Um, so that's another question that Rob Nixon asks. It would probably not be an exaggeration to argue that our moral and ethical bankruptcy, hubristic worldview, failure to ac accept eco-philosophies, and finally, practice ecological sustainable life all stem from one root cause. And what is that? Our physical and spiritual estrangement from nature. On top of that, we have the challenge of finding fitting images and stories to properly portray the dreadfulness of slow violence. My paper contends that all of these aforementioned concerns and challenges could be significantly addressed if we read the indigenous literatures from an eco-critical perspective, because it could not only teach us how to transform our anthropocentric worldview, but also very, uh, I mean, powerfully help us find images to make slow violence more visible and perceivable, a problem that Rob Nixon has already raised. Uh, so now I'd like to read uh, two poems, two short uh, selected first from two poems. The first one that I'm going to read is by uh, uh, a Garo poet. His name is Shonjib Drong. So here it goes. Life in this mountain, this forest, beside the waterfall and the river is no longer what it used to be in the past. The peace and harmony from our old golden era have been lost forever. We are the people who inhabited this land. We lived a life of collective consciousness. In our mother tongue, there is no synonym for words like exploitation, rape, or even robbery. We believe that the earth does not belong to us. Rather, we belong to the earth. When cyclones and tsunamis hit us, they say they have not been able to conquer nature yet. They say humans are helpless in front of nature. What a strange and absurd thought. Nature is not meant to be conquered or defeated. Humans and natures are enmeshed in each other. Humans are connected with rivers, trees, flowers, birds, and everything else. Any claim about human supremacy is utterly wrong. The souls of our dead ancestors are suffering. Today's world reduced into a saleable commodity is unknown to them. We consider this, uh, this heart as our mother. How can people sell their own mother? If the voices of the indigenous peoples are muted, where will you find thoughts and wisdom like this? Who will tell you stories about harmony between humans and nature? So we can see that the poem sends a powerful message against the human supremacist ideas. It strongly criticizes our anthropocentric worldview and dismantles it and promotes the idea of ecological equity and equilibrium. It is quite strongly evident that the serenity of nature and the peace of the native people's minds are intertwined with each other in such a way that the loss of one inevitably results in the destruction of the other. Any act of slow violence done to nature is going to make the indigenous people suffer both physically and spiritually. All the poems I have chosen portray grim pictures of damaged landscapes that have resulted from deforestation, destruction of arable lands, uncontrolled extraction of stones from the riverbeds, and years of slow violence has incurably injured the ecosystem whose effects are now starting to unfold. Um, I'll, like, I'm almost uh, halfway through my paper. I'll probably take another five to seven minutes if, if you allow me. I hope that's all right. The next poem that I'm uh, going to read uh, is called My Heart Cries Out with the Mind Mountains. It's written by an anonymous Chakma poet. So uh, here the poet is talking about the idea that they are not going to celebrate Bizu festival this time. Bizu is like the uh, uh, celebration that marks the beginning of the new year. So the poet says that we are not going to celebrate the festival, but why? Let's find out from the poet himself. Tomorrow is Bizu, but how can I join it? Cracks are opening here and there in the mountains. The flatlands have submerged into water. Flowers have withered away and the petals have fallen off. The prayer halls have fallen apart. Where shall we seek blessings? 
I have taken oath that I will not join Bizu this time. I will starve for my brothers and sisters are suffering. I will starve for the mountains are crying. I will starve for the mountains are bleeding. We would all agree that poetry has the power to make us see the unseeable and think the unthinkable. In this poem, the poet personifies the mountains and imagines them to be bleeding and crying because of the torture they have suffered. It is a very powerful image that actually warns us about the real damage and erosion that are happening in the Chittagong Hill tracks of Bangladesh. Newspaper reports also validate that it is a growing concern and it has been found out that landslides in the Chittagong Hill tracks have increased at a staggeringly high rate, causing unprecedented damage and uh, destruction to people's lives as well as their homes. And according to a research article uh, that was published recently, it was said that from the year 2000 to the year 2018, uh, there were more than 200 reported cases of landslides, which resulted in, in more than 700 deaths. Um, so Bangladesh uh, is among the most, one of the most vulnerable countries to the threats of climate change and the indigenous people uh, that are living here are even at bigger risk because they live in those areas that are geographically at high risk. Places like the mangrove forest, the Chittagong hill tracks are the largest carbon sinks that the country has. And the indigenous people are also managing and looking after these places for years after years, centuries after centuries. So we desperately need to take their stories into our account. I'd like to suggest that reading the indigenous literatures and studying them ethnographically can enlighten us in multiple ways. Uh, and I'd like to make some suggestions now. Firstly, it can tell us about the indigenous people's eco-philosophy and their sacredly symbiotic relationship with nature, which can help us. As eco-critic Glenn Elab says that transform our ego-consciousness into eco-consciousness. Secondly, it can give us valuable insight into the plight and predicaments of the indigenous people, which parallels the damage and destruction done to mother nature. By doing this, we can also substantially address the representational challenges that are caused by low violence. Now, can I, have I think two minutes. Fine. Fine. Okay. Thirdly, it can sensitize us about the traditional ecological knowledge of the indigenous people, as well as the sustainable way of life they lead. And fourthly, understanding the indigenous voices in a South Asian context necessitates the awareness of the history of ecological imperialism. Uh, and people like Garo and Chakma are epitome of the victimization process of the ecological exploitation as well as political marginalization. Therefore, indigenous literatures could help us understand better the more recent and newer forms of both external and internal ecological domination that are done in a neo-colonial context. And finally, the indigenous aesthetics could decentralize modern environmental thinking that is often believed to have originated in the West. Yes, environmental thinking has not necessarily originated in the West and people, the voices of the marginalized communities can help us dismantle and deconstruct that stereotyped concept. And thus it can significantly contribute to emerging fields that are now accepted as post-colonial eco-criticism and indigenous eco-criticism. Before I conclude, I'd like to refer to Professor Johnny Adamson and Salma Monani, who, they, who said that indigenous people's aesthetics should not be taken for granted because their uh, aesthetics are, are often untheorized. So what I suggest is a, a meaningful dialogue between academics as well as between academics and the indigenous people. And if we can have that, maybe in the years to come, we can develop more powerful and contrapuntal narratives, which will profoundly guide us in the years to come. Thank you so much for your patience. And I'll conclude. Yeah, thank you very much. Priya, Priya Kantaji. Yes. Yeah, kindly respond your paper in shortly because we are running short of time. Uh, yeah, I think uh, if it's all right, let, let me wind up the session. I think Mr. Bandar is not here, right? Yeah, not. I think you have your own paper, no? I should have written a paper, but how about the time constraint? No, no, you have five minute, five more minutes, five to six minutes, no problem. You kindly go ahead. Sure, then I'll make my uh, paper short. Uh. So let's make, uh, my topic is that let's make peace with nature. So this is the most amazing planet in the solar system, which is assumed to be inhabited by living beings. For a number of millennia, she has been sheltering humanity affectionately, providing with essentials lavishly. Earth has been 
unlimitedly generous to these human beings, but as usual, the human beings act selfishly and ungratefully. The misconception that they are superior to all has fooled no one but human beings themselves. Therefore, humility is based on nature, both intentionally and unintentionally, which is both senseless and suicidal. The consequences of our recklessness are already appeared apparent the suffering, covering economic losses and the accelerating erosion of life on earth. Entering does not mean surrendering our own development gain. The city cancels the rightful aspiration of poor patients and people to enjoy better living standards. On the contrary, making peace with nature, security it helps, and building on the critical and Undervalued benefits that is provided are key to a prosperous and sustainable future for all. The urgent need to transform our relationship with but by using humanity's vulnerability, the pandemic can also help make future a turning point towards a more sustainable and inclusive world by bringing together the latest scientific evidence showing the impacts and threats of the climate emergency. Let the planet broken. By transforming how we view nature, we can recognize its true value. By reflecting this value in policies, plans, and economic systems, we can channel investment into activities that restore nature and the coming decades. We must seize the opportunity presented by the COVID-19 crisis to accelerate change. We see in several major international conferences, including on climate change, biodiversity and desertification, provide an opportunity to increase ambition and action on recovering better and addressing climate disruption. The central objective should be to build a global coalition for carbon neutrality. If adopted by every country, city, financial institution, and company around the world, the drive to reach net zero emissions by 2050 can still avert the worst impacts of climate change. Similar urgency and ambition are needed to transform other systems, including how, produce our, how we produce our food and manage our water, land, and ocean. Developing countries need more assistance to reduce environmental decline. We have the ability to transform our impact on the world. A sustainable economy driven by renewable energy and nature-based solutions will create new jobs, cleaner infrastructure, and a resilient future. An inclusive world at peace with nature can ensure that people enjoy better health and the full respect, respect of their human rights so they can live with dignity on a healthy planet. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, 2020 was emerging as a moment of truth for our commitment to steer Earth and its people towards sustainability. Momentum was building and global meetings were set to discuss bold action on the three interconnected planetary crises facing humanity, namely the climate crisis, the nature crisis, and the pollution crisis. These crises, driven by decades of relentless and unsustainable consumption and production, are amplifying deep inequalities and threatening our collective future. The science is clear that we are putting extreme pressure on the planet. According to the 2020 UNEP emission gas report, while the pandemic resulted in a temporary decline in greenhouse gas emissions, we are heading for at least a 3 Celsius temperature rise this century. Loss of biodiversity and ecosystem interbreed together with climate change and pollution will undermine our efforts on 80% of assessed SDG targets, making it even more difficult to report progress on poverty reduction, hunger, health, water, cities, and climate. We need to look no further than the global pandemic caused by COVID-19, a zoonotic disease transmitted from animal to human to know that the finely tuned system of the natural world has been disrupted. And finally, the toxic trial of economic growth, pollution and waste, which results every year in the premature deaths of millions of people across the world. While the response to the medical emergency of COVID-19 rightly preoccupies government budgets and political action, the response to this pandemic must ultimately accelerate the economic and social transformations needed to address the planetary emergency. 
The report outlines what the repair of our planet entails the transformative action that can unleash human ingenuity and cooperation to uh, secure livelihood and well-being for all. Repair means solutions that recognize how our environmental, social, development challenges are interconnected. Repair means shifting our values and world views as our financial and economic systems. Repair means taking a whole of society approach and repair means being fair and just. Thank you. Yes, um, uh, this uh, 15th session of a three-day uh, online conference on environmental literature has uh, come to an end. And uh, thank you so much, all the uh, panelists, uh, right from uh, the chair, uh, Kanchana uh, Priyakantaji uh, from Sri Lanka, uh, uh, Shahinur Rahmanji from Bangladesh, uh, Mohammad Hassan Jan from Bangladesh, uh, Dr. Poonam Nigam Sahaji from India uh, for presenting your uh, great papers. With this, this uh, session has come to an end. Namaskar. Thank you. Namaskar, Rajit Kaur Ji. Namaskar. Namaskar.